Facebook, get you to say hi to me, welcome you. I'm so glad you're joining wherever you're joining from. Glory to God. There we go. Turn my volume down. Well, here we are in part four of the series, the last part. How many of you have gotten something out of this series so far? A couple people. I really like what Pastor Jim said. I, you know, he was talking about change and transition and, and referencing, you know, the winter and how uh, uh, it's coming every year. But I think we were saying behind him, sometimes when people don't come, they're almost in denial of it. Right? Like, they're like, oh, I don't want this. And we were all saying, you know, the older I get, the less I like winter. I've discovered that. So, Murray, you must hate winter, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> the kids are like, it's snowing, it's fun. And you're like, oh, another winter. But you kind of get in, in denial. But I was just thinking in terms of change and transition, we've been talking about, and God's been getting us to hear about going beyond. But honestly, if we don't allow the words that have been spoken to change us or transition us, nothing, nothing adjusts. Come on. There will be some things, this, and this tied in what God's had in my heart about where James says, be doers of the word and not hearers only. And then he says this, this isn't in my notes, but, uh, and then he says this, if you come to church and you listen to a preacher or you go to small groups or you take the word in and you hear it and you walk out that door and do nothing with it, you are deceived. It says, be doers of the word, not hearers only right? Deceiving yourselves. If you come in and you become a hearer. And so we, really what Pastor Jim was saying too is we have to allow the Word of God to transition us. And that's not easy. And so we've been talking about beyond and we started with two parts on getting beyond insecurities. And I think sometimes we hear that and go, oh, that's cool. Pastor Derek's talking about beyond insecurities. Isn't that great? But I th- in order to go beyond into the next season of what God wants to do, some of us are going to need to get thicker skin. Come on. And so we can do two parts like that, and you say, oh, that's great, he's talking about this, but there's a reason why, because God's saying you've got to be able to get beyond the insecurities, because I want to take you to some places, and guess what? The more places that you go that are out there and beyond, the more people are going to comment, potentially to make fun of you. People thought Jesus was out there. And if he hadn't got beyond insecurities, we're going to talk about this today, and and in a different form, if he wouldn't have got there, he would have never made it to the cross. Oh, come on. He would have never made it to the beyond. He would have went back like the disciples. And so we have to contend with the word of this last season and even that, uh, of, of the conference and go, what is God wanting to do? Are we going to change and allow God to transition us? Or are we just going to stay the same? Because I'm going to be doing the same message. We're going to be hearing the same things two years from now going, well, I guess we didn't go beyond anywhere. And you know, that Pastor Derek sure got it wrong. Or... We just weren't willing to transition. And last week, we talked about complaining. I was thinking of uh, uh, Gospel Bill. Back in the day, and there was a dream that Nicodemus, I think, would have. You complain too much. You complain. I don't know. I just had a flashback to that. He's like, no, no, because he was complaining, and he was having this dream. And he was like, you complain too much. And I'm like, that has obviously stuck with me many years later. But I think we live in a society, at a time in society, where, where uh, uh, the currency of communication is complaining. I thought of that. I wish I would have had it last week, but I thought of it as a, the currency of communication is complaining. The squeakiest wheel gets the grease. I actually had someone tell me that. Hey, if you squeak the most, they'll pay most attention to you. Well, you know. And so the currency of what people say is, hey, if I complain, I at least get noticed, or someone takes my side, or someone validates me, and so we hear complaints. But the problem is, if you look at the Israelites and what they did, when they complained, it kept them out of the promised land. It kept them out. And what should have been, which most experts say should have been an 11-day journey from Egypt to Canaan, the promised land, took 40 years And we could be sitting here saying, God, why hasn't it happened yet? And God's saying, have you checked your mouth lately? This is for people online. Everyone here is good at this, right? Just for people online, you should have come today and then you would have been forgiven, right? But we live in a currency of complaints. 
And if this week you were actually taking the word, you would have caught yourself many times going, we're getting towards that. Right? And so we need to make sure in terms of going beyond that, my idisic, my ID is I see my identity is in Christ. I gave out cards to remind ourselves, your identity is in Christ, not your insecurities. We need to be fixed on Jesus, still on that pole. We left Jesus up on that pole. Just a picture, our name of it. So we understand we need to be fixed. And then last week we learned you have to get beyond complaining because it'll hold back the promises of God in your life. And even if you're just talking about things, words are producers. Words produce. And so even if you're just reiterating what's happened, you are actually affirming what's going on and watch this, causing it to produce again. So when you're talking about slash complaining about something, it's producing by your words and it keeps the cycle going. So instead of complaining about it, what can we compliment? What can we pray about? And then Jesus said, there's really no fault And if we start to understand, like this is the idea, the adulterous woman came and everyone wanted to cast stones and Jesus said, he who has no fault, he who hasn't sinned, cast the first stone and only Jesus and her are left. And he goes, I don't condemn you. That picture is unbelievable because even the fact we can get up and complain about something only happens because Jesus went on the cross and said, I'm going to find no fault in you. And so we've decided to use that no fault, what Jesus did for us, and we went, hey, thanks, Jesus. Thanks for forgiving our sins and clearing it so we can, you know, not." and and what we've done with that is we've decided to find fault in others. Instead of doing the same thing for others, which Jesus did for us. Oh, this is good, isn't it? (laughs) Right? And so the only reason we can get on a, you know, high horse or pedestal and complain or say something or find fault is because we actually have been forgiven fault because we've all, we're all at fault. We're all at fault. We're all at fault. Did you know that? We all have fault. Everybody has messed up, haven't we? We've got it wrong sometimes. We've sinned. And so because of that, our sin should destroy us. And Jesus came and went, I, I'm going to take this. I went on the cross to take that price So don't use it to find fault in others to destroy them. Forward the forgiveness. Anyways, this isn't even, this is just the review. You guys are listening good today. How's everyone doing? Some of you got some winter faces on. Some of you are good. Right? You know who you are. I'll try not to look at you, you with the winter faces. Maybe you had a bad morning and it was hard to get to church today. Maybe you're at home. I got a text and someone's like, we were planning to be there, but our winter tire, you know, that we switched went flat this morning. And so, but we're going to jump into part four here. You probably saw the sign coming in. Did anyone see the sign coming in that said, hello there, you're grounded. Today, I'm going to send you to your rooms. (laughs) Anyone ever been sent to the room? Okay, today I'm going to ground you. I'm hoping today at the end of the day, you'll come out and you'll think, man, I just got grounded. Anyone ever been grounded before? It was the mid-1990s. And I was 14 or 15 years old. It was a Friday night around 10.50 p.m. and my curfew was 11. Give or take 30 minutes, it's a little hazy. And I was with a good friend, Scott Rysav. He's still my good friend today. He was my ride. And there's a few other friends there and my then girlfriend at the time was there. It wasn't Nicole. I'm sorry, babe. And I was on cloud nine getting to spend time with my girlfriend. Let me help you out. A Christian environment with a girlfriend was pretty tame. Some of you may be thinking it was different, but you know, I don't know. We were being bad. I think I held her hand or we touched hands or something. It was like, woo, you know, something like that's what it was. As a Christian, that was a pretty big deal. But I was loving it. And in my head, I knew I'm not going to make it back for curfew, but I was with her and all this. And I remember my other friend was like, you've got to get home. We're going to get in trouble, I think, you know, and all that. But I thought, oh, it's worth it. And, and so I, I don't remember. I think I was about an hour late for curfew. And I don't remember if they met me at the door or if later they asked me out or they're sleeping. Whatever the process was, there was a conversation that was had with my parents about coming home late for curfew. And it wasn't pleasant. They were not happy. And I don't know what I said or what I did. But I know this. I got grounded for two weeks. Yeah, I saw Tristan. He's like, what? Hey, is that nothing? 
Tristan's like, that's nothing, or he was like, that was a lot. I can't tell his reaction, because he's like, two weeks. But here's what happened. So I thought, okay, I got grounded, and I think probably in my head, I was thinking when I was going to be late for curfew, I probably knew I was going to get grounded and thought, ah, it's not going to be a big deal, because my experience with grounding was this. My friends would get grounded for two weeks or something like that. Day one, they'd be grounded, couldn't do anything. Day two, day three was really solid. Day four, it started to seem to get a little relaxed. And then day five, you know, and then eventually what I experienced is parents would wear, or children would wear their parents down, and by like part of week two, it was like, just get out of the house. And so grounding never, Lauren is like, yeah, like grounding was never lasted as long as you made it, right? You're like, we're going to be grounded, and you're going to do this. And so I thought, oh, it's going to be no big deal. Well, my mom, when she grounded me, I say this story, I didn't get grounded a lot, but when she grounded me, it was for every second of the grounding. <laughs> like, I'm not talking to the minute, and it was in my room, no friends, and I had the embarrassment of like, oh, I can't go to that, you know why? And I'm like, oh, you know, like some of that. And so it was two weeks, I remember, to the like hour, no screen time. I think we only had three channels back then, so that wasn't near as big a deal as it is today. But it was in my room, and for two weeks, I was grounded, and I didn't like it. <laughs> Anybody? Any teenagers? Anybody remember being, you know... And she held to it, and I was like, and I really felt this. Man, that grounding was something that she was doing to me. Moses, and she's trying to take away my joy and my fun, and I was only late for this, and that's just not fair. You know, everything we all say. But as I've gotten older and more mature, I have realized that the grounding wasn't something my parents did to me. It was something they did for me. I know you don't like to hear this. I'm looking at some of the teenagers here, and they're like, Wah. but it's something parents were doing for me. Because as a kid, I thought it was the way from keeping me from having fun. I thought it was to make me miserable, to embarrass me in front of my friends, have to tell me I got grounded, you know. But as an adult, I could see how it kept me in line. It helped make me, helped make me realize I needed to make better decisions when I was out with my friends. Help keep me, keeping me, uh, help me keep things in perspective. Help me tame my wild side. It only worked a little bit, right? Nothing good ha happens after midnight. Can I just make a blanket statement? Teenager, prospective person dating someone else, nothing good happens after midnight. It's true. The switch, I just remember the switch, you know, the things and like, well, back in the day, we have conversations on the phone. You know, and your parents could pick it up. You'd be like, are they listening? <laughs> right? The little click on the other end. But after midnight, you know, you just get into it and everything. And then the next day you'd be like, what was I saying? I was promising the world or I opened up. And so after midnight, things get squirrely. So I don't know what it is. But that's, what, that's why curfews are in place. It helps us. And so how many of you know as a kid, looking back, it was probably good every once in a while you and I got grounded, correct? Maybe. But listen, we think it just should stop as a kid and now we're free or we become teenagers, different things. But maybe as a teenager, maybe as an adult, maybe as an employee, maybe as a church attender, maybe there's times in our life that we need to get a good grounding. Maybe we need to be sent to a room to fix ourselves, to rearrange some stuff so we can get a hold of ourselves to learn some more about ourselves. How about that? So today we're going to talk about that about getting grounded. The word grounded in this definition here means restricted to your home, not to be allowed to partake in certain acts, not allowed to leave your house as punishment, get sent to your room. Man, there's some good chat going on here. <laughs> good job, Facebook people. I'm missing out. Scott, you would go crazy being stuck at home. That's what the chat's going on on the church chat. Hey, you might want to join it. It's quite fun. So it means you're getting sent to your room. And so I believe this firmly, like I did with getting beyond insecurities, getting beyond complaining. Listen, in order to go beyond, sometimes we have to learn how to be grounded. You're grounded. We have to allow something to get, uh, ground us. And so today I'm telling everybody you're grounded. Look at your neighbor and say you're grounded. Come on, if you're watching today, I see there's lots of chat going, Just tell me, say, Pastor Derek, you're grounded. I know some of you have been wanting to tell me that for a long time. So online, if you're watching today, you can say, Pastor Derek, you're grounded. Look at somebody else and say, go to your room. I know some of you kids and teenagers that are in here, you love saying that to your parents because you've been wanting to say that to them. 
So we're going to jump into it today. The text we're reading from today is Luke 2. You'll probably hear a bit more about this as we get close to Christmas. But I'm going to start in verse 39 and give you a bit of the context for this. Uh, Jesus has just been born to Joseph and Mary. And uh, uh, they're going through the processes of, of what is required of them after uh, having a baby. They circumcised Jesus at eight days. And after 40 days of purification, it's required that the firstborn uh, son of everybody uh, who's Jewish brings him to the temple and they have to dedicate him to God. And so Mary and Joseph have been there and they're 40 days, they're bringing Jesus to the temple and there's this guy called Simeon, who's an old, wise, uh, probably person who's worked in the temple, a prophet, a man of God, filled with the spirit of God. And he's been waiting for this moment for a long time. And God tells him to go to that temple today, and when he sees Jesus, everything is like, he gets excited, and he starts being like, man, here's, here's, here's the Savior of the world. He says this. This is someone I think he likes something like, he's going to bring light to the, to the Gentiles. He talks about the transition. This guy's going to bring change to the Gentiles. He's going to be redemption for the Israelite people and all this, and he starts doing this blessing over Jesus. And Mary and Joseph are taking this in and kind of going, you know, Mary's probably going, yeah, I know a lot that happened here. I remember the, uh, the encounter with the messenger who told me I was going to to have Jesus and the immaculate conception and all that, but this is confirmation of what they know, and then Anna, a prophetess, hears it or is there, and she goes around and starts proclaiming, redemption is here. Redemption is here. And so Jesus has this amazing dedication and blessing, and so Mary and Joseph would have been a part of all that, and we're going to read in verse 39 in Luke 2. It says this, and when his parents had completed everything in accordance to the law, of the Lord, they returned to Galilee to their own city of Nazareth. Now the child, Jesus, continued to grow and become strong. That's key to remember that. Jesus had to grow and become strong. Jesus had to grow and become strong, increasing in wisdom. Jesus was not one years old and all wise. Jesus probably had to get his diaper changed. Right? Right? Like, I was going to get into this, and I was having a discussion with my wife. Jesus was without sin, but he made mistakes. <gasps> he might have got an answer wrong on a math test. <laughs> Maybe when he was doing some carpentry, he measured once and cut three times, you know? Because we get this picture that Jesus just came out all-knowing everything, and he never made a mistake, never said, never burped, never farted, you know, like, he just didn't do anything. Angels came down and took care of everything, and you're like, oh, no, he was like us. Fully God, fully man. He had the spear without measure, but he had to grow up and learn wisdom and stature and had to develop some things. And so we get a good picture of Jesus in the first month and a half of Jesus' life, and they've been following all the customs. And I'm sure Mary and Joseph were telling Jesus everything in these first years about how his birth was, what Simeon said, what Anna said, telling him about his life. And he's growing up learning about his calling and purpose in his life. And they're teaching him about it. And he grows and he comes stronger and he increases in wisdom and the favor of God is upon him. And it says this in Luke 2.41. His parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. So since Jesus was born every year, it was the custom that they had to go to the Feast of the Passover. Now, interestingly enough, that was a celebration of what we talked about last week. The Israelites coming out of Egypt from slavery, they were celebrating that, but it was also when the blood of the lamb was put on the doorposts and the angel of death passed over their house. And every year it was required of them to go to Jerusalem and celebrate the Feast of Passover for seven days. And they would do a whole party and a whole celebration. We're going to talk about this at the end when we do communion. But just to pause here, man, I think we sometimes lose something in today's day and age when we forget to go back to specific landmarks or times God's done something in our life to consistently celebrate it. We forgot some of that. They did this every year. Why? So they wouldn't forget. And we'll talk about that. Pastor Jim mentions that in communion all the time. That's why we do communion. So we don't forget, but I think we could use some more things in our life where we go back and go, hmm, what did God do that was significant? And we actually consistently celebrate it. Maybe we could change some of our prayer times during meals if you pray before your meals that they're not just Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Whoever eats the fastest gets the most. But maybe we turn it into pointed times where we take times two, three times a day to actually celebrate and remember God's goodness. I think that's why they did that, 
to make these kinds of moments. So anyways, I'm getting off track, but his parents went there every year at the Feast of Passover. And so they celebrated for seven days and fulfilled all this in verse 42. And when he was 12 years old, they went up there according to the custom of the feast. So we know Jesus was 12 years old. We know that he's been going there every year for his life, so he's been going there for a while. And at 12 years old, he probably would have been starting to go in school under some rabbis around five or six. By the age of 10, he would have already memorized the Torah, the first five books of what we now know as the Old Testament. And at 12 years old, if you believe it or not, he was getting ready to be bar mitzvahed. In Jewish custom, I think at 13 years for the guys, 12 years, bat mitzvah for the girls, but they would be bar mitzvah, which is a celebration of their coming of age, of their maturity, of their responsibility as, as, as a man. They did it a little younger then. And so he was 12 years old, and he would have been going through that, and he would have been studying under some rabbis and doing some different stuff, and he would have been probably seeking out some rabbis to get some training and different. So all that's going on. And for 12 years, he's been going to the feast of the Passover. He's had some experience in this. And so this may seem young for us at 12, what is about to happen. But it wasn't that out of the normal. But at 12 years old, we don't know if he could have been one day away from 13 at this point. You know, like in celebration, he could have been a week, he could have been a year. And he, so he's kind of struggling with this, I'm ready to go, I'm mature enough, I can go in, but not quite yet. And so we read the next verse here. In verse 43, and it says this, so they go up to the feast of the Passover as their custom was, and it says, as they were returning, after spending the full number of days required, the boy Jesus, it says boy Jesus, not man yet, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem, but his parents were unaware of it. See, now it seems a little crazy because you read that and you go, what kind of dumb parents, right, are leaving on a trip? This is the first home alone, <laughs> right? Like they got a lot of kids and everything's chaotic and they go and they're like, where is, I forget his name, but they're like, where is he? And he left him at home. This is the first home alone movie. And you're like, what kind of parents do? But you got to remember, I gave you the context. I think for 10, 11, 12 years, Joseph, or Joseph, Jesus was going there, and they probably gave him freedom throughout that seven days. They're probably like, they were playing with their friends. They were doing different stuff. They had to be at certain places. And I'm sure towards this, as he's 12, getting towards 13, they said, listen, as long as you're there when the train leaves, as long as you're there at the flight time, we leave this morning, you can be there with friends, but as long as you're there, and for the last few years, you know, as long as you're there, your curfew is this. Be there at nine in the morning, eight in the morning, when the caravan is about to leave. And for 11 years, it's worked. I mean, obviously they weren't doing it when he was a baby, but and 12 years, or up to 12 years, it has worked. And so things are fine. Don't blame Mary and Joseph as much as you think. This probably wasn't as crazy as we read it to be. And so Jesus stayed behind. And in verse 44, instead they thought he was somewhere in the caravan and they went a day's journey, a day's journey. <laughs> and then I, built, I think this is what happened, right? So typically maybe the last few years Jesus has been out and about and then at supper time he was probably usually as a hungry boy came back at supper time to get his meal, you know, and so they would know that he's there on that first day's journey and he'd be doing some stuff with friends and they got to supper time and Jesus wasn't there to get his food on that first day's journey. And they're like, this, is un this isn't normal. Like, what's happening here? And so they start going to family and friends. Hey, have you seen Jesus? Last time I saw him, he was playing on the streets in Jerusalem. Okay, have you seen Jesus? I saw him hanging out at the arcade. Did you see Jesus? Yeah, he was doing, oh my goodness. And they walked through it all. And it says this, they went a day's journey and they began looking for among their relatives and acquaintances. And they're all saying, no, we last saw him in Jerusalem, verse 45, and when they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem looking for him. They realized, man, he's not here. Did we just lose the Savior of the world? Like, did, is the King of Kings getting killed somewhere? But think of a parent at this point. We think, oh, like, like societies would have been a lot different, but they would have still had people in them that meant harm. Is he getting trafficked? I'm not kidding. Did someone snag him? What's happening? Did we just ruin all of, you know, history and humanity? 
Jesus isn't here, and they go back looking for him. Here's another thing, too, so that you can feel what they were feeling. They went as a caravan, probably because it was way more fun and helped them provide, but it was also for protection. And so when they went back, I highly doubt the whole caravan followed them back. So they were putting their lives in danger to go back. So they go a day out, a day back. It's two days of travel to come back. And so I'm sure there's a lot of things kind of going on in a parent's mind in this. From like, oh my goodness, to like, what has he, you know, like, you're probably anger and then, and then worry and dread and complete panic and anxiety. All the emotions. And so they returned to Jer- Jerusalem to look for him. Do you know that there was no find my iPhone back then? Hey, put it in. Do you have, you know, do you, are we sharing on the Apple? Can you put it in to find my iPhone? There was no Amber Alert. You couldn't even hold up a picture and said, have you seen this guy? Right? So they're trying to find him with very little to go on. And it says this in verse 46. Then after three days. Yeah, some of your parents are like, ha, 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 ha. Three days they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of teachers. Happy as can be, proud as punch. Both listening to them and understanding and asking them questions, and all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. It took them three days to find took them three days to find him. He's been AWOL for five days now. I don't know what he was doing for food, or he was just impressing everybody and they were feeding him there. But listen, this was not a oops, I missed it moment because maybe a few hours and he's like oh my goodness or like that or like oh I don't know and we'll see by his answer he wasn't like oh yeah I got lost track of time and I walked around the city and I knew I missed you and I was trying to get there's none of that there it's literally like well you'll see his answer but this wasn't a whoops three days into it you're not going you know if I was you know two days late for my curfew that's not a oops like that's something going on and so he's now three days past and everything's going on on where he was supposed to be And I think this, at the age of 12, just to be about bar mitzvahed, Jesus was probably getting ready in the temple trying to impress some rabbis. Because this was the time where a rabbi would select you or you would go after one. Some people believe you'd have to ask them. But they would select you and at 13 you'd either follow the track of schooling and theology or if you weren't accepted by a rabbi or didn't connect, you would go do your father's trade. And so he's probably in there going, I'm at the hub of the world, of the then known, and I'm in Jerusalem, and I'm impressing the top of the top. And I'm setting up what for my ministry? I'm getting ready. I'm doing what it was. I, I, you know, I'm, I've been told all this stuff about what I'm going to do, and so he's getting ready to do that. See, I was only a late, late for, uh, an hour late for my curfew, and I got grounded for two weeks. Jesus was three days late for his curfew, and he got... He got in trouble for, for that, as we'll see. And I'm sure his parents, like, he, they come in and they see him. And imagine all of the emotions going on with first relief. He's here. He's safe. Oh, my goodness. He looks like he's well. He looks like he's fed. Maybe then a little bit of frustration, but they're like, we'll give him the benefit of the doubt. Let's ask him what happened. And this is what they say. Verse 48, when Joseph and Mary saw him, they were bewildered. I think it's more just like, oh, he's there. He's in the temple, but he looks fine. What is happening? And his mother said to him, son, why have you treated this way, treated us this way? Why are you just sitting in here? Why weren't you at curfew? Why would you put us through all this? Any parents ever been there? Why would you do this? <laughs> why are you, st- what is happening? He says, behold, Mary says, your father and I have been anxiously looking for you. They get over the relief of finding him, and they want an explanation from him before they light into him. Maybe there's a reasonable explanation. Why did you do this? Why did you miss curfew? Or maybe this, boy, you better have a good explanation for this. Anyone ever heard that? Anyone ever said that? Boy, you better. And look at Jesus' great explanation. And he said to them, why were you looking for me? (laughs) Can you imagine, parents? Can you imagine... Running away from home for three days, your kids do, and you find them, and they're like, why were you looking for me? 
And then he says this statement, did you not know that I had to be in my father's house? Now listen, teenager, I know there's going to be a point in time in your life where you feel like you know more and you're cooler and you're there with your parents and you kind of look and go, well, why are you doing this to me? And you may be even like Jesus and try to throw a scriptural or spiritual thought behind it. I was about God's business and hope it works. And I think this verse has been misinterpreted or misunderstood for a long time because we've taken it as, oh, Jesus was so much smarter than his parents and Mary and Joseph were just so dumb that they couldn't understand what was going on. Oh, those uncool, dumb parents. They don't get me as a teenager. They don't get what I'm going through. I, right? They just don't know anything. They're not in touch anymore. Jesus is like, I'm ready. Put me in, coach. And he says this, why were you looking for me? Did you not know that I was, had to be in my father's house? He was, he was a teenager, guys. Like, we think he's just, oh, he's like, he was dealing with teenager hormones. 12, 13, I've, I've recognized this. Guys get dumb when they go through puberty. <laughs> they do. They'll be the best students, and then puberty hits, and it's like everything, all the energy is required just to change, transition, and everything else doesn't matter. So Jesus is going, he was a teenager, and he's trying to step up his teenager freedom. Did you not know I had to be in my father's house? They're like, excuse me, pardon moi, come again, say what? Speak into my good ear, son. <laughs> right? Like, I don't know if I caught you. And so, I don't know if this is exactly the response that most people thought in what Jesus was saying. That he was just so beyond in his maturity and wisdom. He knew things his parents didn't know because he was smarter than them, right? Teens, you think that? You're not right. And so he says, why were you looking for me? Don't you know I had to hang out here at the temple? That would be like me saying to my parents after curfew, why are you worried about me? Didn't you know I had to hang out with my friends? That, that grounding would have been four weeks. And my parents would have had the same response. See, we read Mary and Joseph's response like this, and think it's something, you know, super. But my parents would have had this response to my answer. Like, why were you looking for me? Didn't you know I had to hang out with my friends? This was where the response in verse 50. And yet they on their part did not understand the statement which he had made to them. Of course they didn't. They're saying like, what? I'm sorry. I'm hearing what you're saying, but I'm not comprehending what you're telling me. You're saying that you left us to look for five days and all you got to say for yourself is, yeah, I'm hanging out here. I'm supposed to be. I'm about my father's business. Of course there was some confusion in their mind unto what Jesus was saying. And so they most say they just couldn't understand what Jesus understood. And I, I understand he might have known some things. He might have had some thoughts about his calling and being ready to step into it. And he was ready to go. But if this was the case, that Jesus' ways were higher and that it was his time, you would have seen Mary and Joseph's response, something like, good, stay in the temple, Jesus. Yeah, it's your time. And you would have seen him stay in Jerusalem, find a rabbi, and step into some things. And we would have kept hearing about him if that was actually what was happening here. But that's not what happened. It says this in the beginning of verse 51 of Luke 2. He's done all this. They're confused by what he says. And so it says this. It's not him going to a rabbi. It's not him stepping into his ministry. He's saying, put me in, coach. I'm ready. I'm smarter. I know some things. I'm about to be bar mitzvahed. I'm about to be a man. I'm ready. Interesting side note. Do you want the side note or should I leave it? <laughs> I don't know if anyone would ever feel good. No, leave it. This is, uh, at the age of 13, when they got bar mitzvah, I, I do believe this is the age. Uh, what would happen is after they became of age and they become men, the dad would bring them into the marketplace 
And he would stand up in front of all the market they go and they would do their trades and different things like that. And he would stand up and after they'd been bar mitzvah and he'd come of age, they would make this announcement in front of everyone in the marketplace. The dad would stand up and say this to everyone, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. And what that meant is from that moment on, anything the son said, it was exactly like the father was saying it, and he had all the authority and the power and the permission to represent the father from that moment on in the marketplace. And so if he said it, it was as if the dad was saying it. Jesus was ready to have that moment, but it didn't happen then. But fast forward, Jesus is getting ready for his ministry, which we'll talk about. And he gets baptized And he comes out, and we just think God was like, hey, cool, good job, son. But God says, it says, a voice from heaven said, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. And we read that and think that was great. But what that was signifying was from that moment on, anything Jesus said or did was under the full authority of God the Father. And it was like he had the full permission to represent the Father to anyone from then on. And so he was well pleased and so he had come of age and he could now act on behalf of the Father. So everything Jesus did after that was on the full representation of God the Father. That's just for free. It's cool. I geek out on that sort of stuff. Maybe you do too. And so if Jesus was, you know, everything was good and his ways were higher, you'd see Jesus step into being a rabbi and step into ministry but that's not what happened. Verse 2, Luke 2, 51, it says this, and he went down with them and came to Nazareth. He went down with them and came to Nazareth. They grabbed him here and went, come with me, son. <laughs> right? <laughs> and watch this. And he continued to be what? Subject to them. I say this, Jesus was grounded. He was. You know how I know that? Because you don't hear Jesus mentioned again for 18 years. I was an hour late and I got grounded for two weeks. Jesus was three days late and he got grounded for 18 years. It's true. 18 years you don't hear about him. At 12, he's like, I'm ready, coach. I want to step into my ministry. God's telling me some stuff. I believe God's saying this. Me and Pastor Jim were talking about this. I believe God's directing me. And someone who had some authority and some common sense in his life took him and said, son, you need to get grounded. You need to be grounded. Because if you step into, I fully believe this. If Jesus would have stepped into his ministry at 12, he wouldn't have made it to the cross. And so some people are like, I'm ready to go in, coach. God's telling me this and this. And some people in their life who are authorities are kind of saying, hey, slow down. You don't want to do this yet. Why? Not because they want to hold you back. It's because they want you to be successful once you step in. Oh, come on, this is good. So even Jesus tried to pull the God the Father card. God told me. He may have, but maybe you need to be grounded for 18 years before you actually walk into it. Come on, that's good preaching. Some people need to hear this today. See, we want today, we want three years of preparation for 30 years of ministry. But Jesus had 30 years of preparation for three years of ministry. Now I'll say this, the disciples didn't take 30 years of preparation, but they made a whole lot more mistakes than Jesus did. The longer you sit and are willing to get ground, be grounded, I'll talk about this, the less mistakes you're going to make when you come out. Oh, this is good stuff. I wish someone would have told me this when I was younger. So I put this, here it is, uh, verse 51, the second half and 52. And his mother treasured all the things in her heart. She remembered. She didn't forget everything that God had showed about Jesus. And watch this, Jesus kept increasing in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and people. He had to grow up. Watch this, Jesus needed to be grounded to get grounded. Jesus needed to be grounded to get grounded. I'll take a drink while you write that down or take a picture because I'm going to give you the other definition of grounded and I want you to listen. You guys doing all right? 12 o'clock, what do I got left? Let's see. Five, six, seven minutes, you guys got that in you? Jesus needed to be grounded 
to get grounded. Here's what grounded means, another definition. You ready for this? The first one was, you know, stay at home, not get to go anywhere. Why did Jesus need to be grounded? Because the other one means this, well-balanced, sensible, reasonable. See, some of us need to be grounded so we can get grounded, get a little more reasonable, well-balanced, sensible. Watch this, mentally and emotionally stable. In control of your emotions. See, if Jesus would have jumped out at 12, he would have missed some of this grounding. Because he had to be completely grounded, in control of his emotions, emotionally stable. He had to be mentally uh, stable. He had to be reasonable. He had to be sensible. Can you imagine trying to do everything he did without having that grounding? Watch this. Grounded. is someone who is grounded makes good decisions ready and does not say stupid things. Anyone ever said some stupid things? You need to be grounded. I'm not kidding. We got to get grounded. If your emotions, if my emotions are running my life, if I'm highly volatile based on different things, we talked about it, insecurities, different things, finding fault, then guess what? We need to get grounded. Fixed, I said a few weeks ago. Some of you need to go to your room and spend time with Jesus. Look at someone and say, go to your room. Someone who makes good decisions and does not say stupid things. If you're saying stupid things, you need to get grounded. Someone or something stable, secure, practical, and firmly established. I said this, if Jesus would have tried to go out at 12, I think he wouldn't have been ready and he would have had difficulty. And so Jesus tried to step out in his beyond calling. He was ready to go beyond, which was an amazing calling to the cross. But before he got beyond, he had to be grounded and get grounded. When was the last time you were grounded? So when everything seems all over the place, when we're struggling stuff, what do we ground ourselves? What does it mean to get grounded to you today? You're like, I'm this old and I haven't been grounded. Nobody grounds me. I think sometimes God grounds me. Sometimes things we go through help ground us, bring perspective. But this is in Ephesians 3, and you're probably familiar with this, some of you. And I'm going to read 14 to 17a because I read one of my favorite passages of Scripture. And then I'm done. Read it in a few translations, give a few points, and then we're done and have communion. For this reason, I bend my knees before my Father. I like that. It starts with humi- humbling yourself before God. From whom every family in heaven and earth derives its name. I like that. Do you know that Jesus Christ, Christ isn't just Jesus' last name? You don't walk up to him and say, hello, Mr. Christ. It's not a last name. It's a, it's, a, it's a title of what he is. It says Jesus Christ means the anointed one in his anointing. So when he says this, when he says, from whom every family in heaven and earth derives its name, listen, when you become a part of the family and the kingdom of God, you get the last name Christ. I know you guys are writing stuff. Maybe you're not. I don't know what's happening. But you get the last, think of this. We are all brothers and sisters, what? In Christ. So when we have Jesus on the inside, we get to partake in the anointed one in his anointing. Charlene Christ. Josiah Christ, Jim Christ, Jake Christ. It says, and who in all heaven and earth derive its name. We get that name and that's how we become family. We all have the anointed one and his anointing on the inside of us when you become a part of a family. It's an amazing thing that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory. I love it. It's his glory. To be strengthened with power through his spirit in the inner self so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Watch this. And you being rooted and grounded. We're going to pause there. That word rooted means to strengthen with roots, to render firm. Watch this. To fix. We talked about that a few weeks ago. You being fixed. What? On Jesus. But then there's this other word. And grounded. That's what we're talking about today. The word grounded means, watch this. It means to make stable, establish. Watch. It means to lay the foundation. You being fixed and laying the foundation. What is the foundation we are supposed to build our lives on? You ready? Here's the next verse. This is the ground that establishes us. This is what stabilizes us. That you being rooted and grounded, verse 17, in love. 
You being rooted and grounded in love. And you guys got to catch this. So maybe this is more heard and caught than taking notes on this. But watch this. May be able to comprehend with all the saints. Watch this. What is the width and the length and the height and the depth? I'm taking a drink because I'm getting ready to go crazy. What is the width, the length, the height, and the depth? See, listen, listen, listen. We are rooted and grounded, what? In love, in the love of Christ. That word love there is the word agape. In 1 John 4, it's the same word that says God is agape. We got to get rooted and grounded in that idea of who God is. But watch this. It says that you may need to know, and it lists four different things. See, sometimes we probably think the love of God is very one-dimensional. Do you know anything with math? I'm a little bit of a math person, right? But one dimension just means it has one element. And most of the things we deal with right now are at least two-dimensional. They have length and width. But they're on a plane. It's like a surface. So if you had a piece of paper, that's a 2D thing. They call them two-dimensional things, a piece of paper right there. It has length and width. You can figure out the perimeter. You can figure out the area, but it's on this plane. It's on the 2D dimension. And so it says, the love of God that you may be able to comprehend the length and width. But watch, there's more. It also says the height. And when you add height, you add a third dimension. So no longer is it just on a plane or a two-dimensional surface. Now what happens is there's volume there or there's area or it takes up space. It takes up space. This has things. It has volume. It takes up space in your life. So Paul here is saying that not only do you want to know it on a length and width, but it needs to start taking up space in your life. There's volume to this love of God that you comprehend. And so he says there's a dimension, there's new dimensions, and then there's a third dimension, but he doesn't stop there. He says length, width, height. Some people say height and depth are similar, but for this purpose, I think it's not. Because he goes, and then there's depth, there's weight, there's glory to this. Watch this. Then you get to 40. See, most of us are experiencing God or trying to understand his love maybe on a one dimension or a two dimension and it's not taking up space and weight. But he says this, I want you to be able to know and experience the love of God. He says no later, which is an experiential knowledge and intimate knowledge. In 4D, I remember going to Disney. Anyone ever been to Disney? This was way back. Do you remember when 3D movies came out? See, first of all, we watch most movies in 2D. It's on a screen, on a surface, on a length and width with like area. But then they came out with 3D. Do you remember the first time you put on 3D and you put on those goggles? Some of you, if it was way back in the day, it probably didn't change a lot when you watched it because the 3D wasn't that good. But you throw on 3D goggles now, or glasses, and what changes about the video? What changes about the picture that you're watching? It has depth. It comes out at you, it takes up space, and you experience it at a whole new level. That's another dimension. You go, oh, this is different than before. Now I'm getting to experience this now. But now they have these things with 4D, or in Disney they did it the most, where I went to watch a Disney cartoon, or they were showing something, and it was 4D, and I was like, what does 4D mean? And so you go in, and you see the screen, you put on your 3D goggles, and it's coming at you, and then all of a sudden, all of a, what would happen is somebody would jump into the water, and they jump in, and all of a sudden, you'd get splashed with water. And I was like, what is happening here? And then they'd be going on like a fast plane or something, and you'd feel wind blowing from left to right, and then before you know it, you're moving, your chair starts to shake and do this. That is the 4D experience And so Paul is not being accidental like this. He's saying that we need to be rooted and grounded in the love of Christ, which has not just one dimension, which is not just two-dimensional, come on, which is not just three-dimensional, come on. It is four-dimensional. He is saying the love of God isn't something you're just supposed to see. It isn't just something that's supposed to take up room in your life, but the love of God is something you're supposed to be able to experience and feel and affect every part of your emotions and your senses. It's something that should be all around you and that you can participate in and feel because there's a lot of people that say you know walking with God and all that it's not about feelings this proves it is and you aren't actually experiencing the 4d love of God unless there is feelings and impact on you involved the love of God should put water on you It should blow through. It should shake your seat. It should do some stuff. And so he's saying that we need to be rooted and grounded. The foundation is this love. I got to get done. You guys are listening too good. 
The love of God is what? Beyond this dimension. Beyond our plane of understanding, it has width, it has length, it has height, and there's weighty depth to it. Here's a statement I made. You can take a picture of it. I tried to wrestle with this to try to make it clear. If it works for you and it helps you, good. If not, I'm going to move on because I see a lot of people yawning. So we need, here it is. You can take a picture if you want it. We're going to go fast past it, and then I'm going to be done. We need to get grounded in the love of God until we experience the multidimensional realms of this love so much that we know that we know that we are filled with all the fullness of him. Take it, think about it. Let me know if you could have worded it better. <laughs> we need to get grounded in the love of God until we experience the multidimensional realms, 2D, 3D, 4D, of this love so much that we know that we know that word know means experiential. It's not just a head knowledge. It's an experiential, you've intimate knowledge. You felt the 4D effects of it on your life that we are filled with all the fullness of him. I'm not going to read it for the sake of time, but you should read Ephesians 3, 14 to 19 in the message. It's fantastic. So here's what we need to get grounded in if we want to go beyond. We need to get grounded in the love of Christ. It's summing up everything we've been talking about. And what does the love of Christ do when we're grounded in it? Remember, it talked about being emotionally stable, not saying stupid things. When we get grounded in the love of Christ, the, every dimension of it, guess what? It tells us to say, hey, maybe you shouldn't say that. Maybe you shouldn't do that. Maybe you should forgive this. Maybe you don't have to think this way about this, right? The love of Christ grounds us, and so we stop saying stupid things. We stop doing stupid things. And if we start saying, what would the love of Christ being grounded in? What would that ask of me? It changes everything. Because guess what? We're getting ready to go beyond, and we need to be grounded in the love of Jesus. Because some of the areas we're going to go, Brad would know this as he goes on mission trips. I'm sure he gets challenged at times with the love of Christ and the things he sees. We probably see it outside these doors every day when things frustrate us. And we got to go back and get grounded in the love of Christ and go, okay, how do we handle this? How do we see this? What do we do here? What if this happens? And it straightens and adjusts your life. Why? So that we can go beyond. What? What? Beyond the way this world wants to do things. Beyond the way this world sees things. Beyond where we are today. And Ephesians 3.20 says this. We read this verse a lot. Dwayne White's been here, Hooper, Hooperman and all this, and talked about this verse, but it says this. Now, what is he saying? Now because of everything we just read and understand, what? Now that we are rooted and grounded in love, he is able to do far more abundantly beyond all we ask or think according to the power that works within us. There's a whole lot going on there that I don't have time for. It's the power that works within us. And you think, man, above all we can ask or think, I got some crazy things I can ask or think about, right? But that verse only applies to, you can only apply verse 20 if you step and walk into verse 17 to 19. Because if you, don't have verse if you don't have verse 17 to 19, then guess what? Verse 20, you're going to make some crazy asks. And so he's not saying you just get to ask everything. He's saying, I know if you're rooted and grounded in love, then when you ask stuff, it's going to be according to my purpose, and I'll do exceedingly abundantly above all you can ask or think. And there's a power that works in you when you get grounded in the love of Christ. Music team, come on up. Church, I don't think we can fully step into beyond without first being willing to get grounded in the love of God. So here's the final thing, and I'm done. In order to go beyond, we need to get grounded in love. Look at somebody and say, you're grounded. In the love of Christ. There we go. We need to get grounded in love. Here's the challenge for this week. You ready for the challenge? You say, how do I get grounded in the love of Christ? Here's the challenge. I want you to read two passages of Scripture every day for this week. The first one, you probably know it, 1 Corinthians 13. And the second one, write it down, 1 Corinthians 13. The second one is 1 John 4, 7 to 21. Every day this week, start reading that and start saying, God, ground me in your love. 
root me in the understanding, the four-dimensional, what that means. And I believe that as you do that, God's going to start changing some things about how you see yourself, how you want to act, and you're going to start seeing some of yourself and experiencing things differently. Because church, get ready. God wants to take us beyond. Hallelujah. Well, that's it. Four parts done. Who's ready to go beyond? Who's ready to allow God to change and transition some things in their life, whether it be insecurity, complaining, or how get, getting more into the love of God and what that means in their life? We're going to do communion. We missed it last month because there was lots going on, and I don't want to miss it again. Uh, if you have the elements, I don't know who's given them out. Do we have some people we can hand them out? It might not take as long. But here is the part that I read before that I kind of paused on. Where it said that every year they went up for the feast of the Passover. To remember and celebrate what God had done. Luke 22 says this. When the hour came, he reclined at the table and the apostles with him. This is talking about Jesus towards the end of his life. And he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. They're having a Passover meal. They're celebrating what I talked about that was going on. They're still doing it to that day. And they're celebrating the Passover and what was happening. But what was interesting here is that there's a shift happening. It's happening where they shift from the Passover blood of the lamb on the doorpost to now Jesus is about to be the blood of the lamb for the whole world. I know what people are passing out, so it's a little bit difficult. But understand there's a shift happening to them celebrating Passover in an old way to the new way. Jesus says, you're about to celebrate me because I'm about to be the blood for everyone. And so he says this. For I say to you, I shall not eat again until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And when he had taken a cup and given thanks, he said, Take this and share it amongst yourself. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine from now on until the kingdom of God comes. And when he had taken some bread and given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which has been given to you. Watch this. Pastor Jim says this all the time. Do this in remembrance of me. See, we don't celebrate Passover as Christians like they did before because in this moment, Jesus said, hey, we're celebrating Passover, but something's about to shift. And from now on, we are going to celebrate and remember what Jesus was about to do. And it's a powerful picture of freedom from slavery, freedom from sin, uh, God moving. And so he's saying, this is the same thing. So every time we do this, we're doing what the Israelites did where we're taking a moment to celebrate what Jesus did. And it's an amazing thing in our life, and it tells us to go home. Yes, we do this in remembrance. Thank you, Jesus, for what you did. And I think we can do this kind of stuff a little bit more. And so he does the same with the cup. First Corinthians says in both times, do this in remembrance of me. So it shifted from remembering the Passover and what was about to happen on the cross to celebrating what happened on the cross. And so that's what this is symbolic of. Well, we come in, every month we try to do it, and we take a moment to have the bread for where his body was broken for us, and the blood of Jesus where it was shed for us, so that we could be free. So that, as we said, we could have no fault before him, we could walk boldly before the throne of grace. So we want to take a moment today, and wherever you're at, to just sit, and I'm going to do it this way, usually I lead it, but I want you to just take a few minutes, if you're new with this, then you just take it and say, Jesus, I want to dedicate my life to you, we're going to have a prayer time at the end, don't let me forget. Maybe we won't have it today, gosh because i got to do something else. But on your own for a few minutes, I just want you to take the bread, talk to God, and just say, I want to remember you. Thank you for what you've done for us. That your body was broken, that your blood was shed. Just take a few minutes, and I just really felt that on your own. Say, I want to remember you. Go ahead.